This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Former Blue Angel and Pensacola Mayor John Fogg on this edition of Conversations. John Fogg's distinguished career has taken him down two separate and demanding paths. From pilot to politician, Fogg found a way to excel. The Marine Corps fighter pilot who flew numerous missions in Vietnam climbed to the top of military aviation. In addition to being a Top Gun graduate, John Fogg lived in the rarefied air where only the best aviators reside. In 1973 and 1974, Fogg was a member of the world's most prestigious flight demonstration team, the Blue Angels. Following his military career, John Fogg entrenched himself in his chosen community of Pensacola, Florida. First elected to the city council in 1989, Fogg would ultimately go on to become Pensacola's first elected mayor since 1913, a position he would hold until 2009. Recently, John Fogg penned a very personal book about his life and relationship with Christ. The book entitled, By the Grace of God, is an introspective look at some of the life-threatening experiences he faced. We welcome John Fogg to this edition of Conversations. Nice to see you, my friend. Good to see you, Jeff. I really appreciate the opportunity to visit with you. It's my pleasure. Why write a book? Well, you know, I felt almost compelled to do it. Uh, uh, as I got to the age that I am now and I started looking back at some of the life experiences that I've had, uh, when I strung them all together, I felt as if that the story had to be told because without uh, without the grace of God, I am quite certain I wouldn't be here today had it not been for divine, in divine intervention on more than one occasion. So I really felt that I had a message and life experiences that I wanted to share with other people. Uh, very interesting book. I had an opportunity to read it, and it's um, quite adventurous, I must say. <laughs> and, and I want to get to some of the things that happened to you, but let me ask you this, because most people in this area know that you were a former Blue Angel. Where did your interest in flying first begin? Uh, from my very earliest recollections, I wanted to start playing with airplanes and build models and fly, flying model airplanes, you know, you control airplanes and that, that kind of thing. So I, I just knew at my core, I wanted to be a pilot as a career. And, and I chose uh, the, the military route after college because uh, that was the only way I could get to the airplanes. I really had a passion to fly and that was tactical jet fighters. So that's what I wanted to do for sure all my life. Now, had you flown prior to getting into the military? I got my private pilot's license while I was in college, and, and that was really uh, for trying to get the necessary skills to be able to do better in, in uh, flight school with the Navy. So uh, it was very helpful in that regard, by the way, and, and having that knowledge and not starting at ground zero like many other people did really helped me uh, do well. Okay. So after college, you joined the Marine Corps? I did. Okay. Take me through. What was the process? Uh, the, the process of your career. I mean, you joined the Marine Corps and then ultimately <coughs> ended up in Vietnam. So, sure. Yeah. yeah. As far as the career was concerned, uh, went through flight training, of course, and then um, went to an F-4 training squadron on the East Coast. And then as quickly as they could, they got me into Vietnam. We had a shortage of pilots over there at that particular time in 1969, that was. And so went over there, flew 200 combat air missions there, uh, and then tried the, my best to get assigned to the Naval Air Training Command here in Pensacola because that was the fastest way uh, that I could build the flight time necessary to qualify for the Blue Angels. I never had seen the Blue Angels before until I was in flight training at Softly Field at that time, mm -hmm. and they were flying F-11s at the time. I, I'm dating myself, but uh, <laughs> I saw them flying over Softly Field, and I, I knew in my mind that's what I wanted to try to achieve. It, it just completely blew me away watching what they were able to do. So. So at this point in my career, I was, I was doing everything I could to be as well qualified for selection of the Blue Angels as, as I could. So I was in the training command, had made application for the team. Part of the process there is you have to chase the team around the country to air show sites so that they get to know you. Uh, they already know about your flying skills because they get that from the safety center and headquarters Marine Corps. 
but they don't know about your social skills and your ability to represent Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard or naval aviation uh, in the environment, in the air show environment. So uh, you follow them around and they get to know you better. And and then, and, and the way the selection process works is th there were probably 60, 70 people that applied. They narrow that down to maybe a dozen and then those dozen people follow the air show or the blues around the country and they basically are watching you're under a microscope the whole time how do you relate uh, to the general public how do you relate in the air show environment and and that kind of thing and and fortunately uh, I was selected and and then went on to fly two years with the blues and there's some great stories in the book uh, about <laughs> about uh, that that experience after that I just went back to the fleet uh, and stayed in the fleet in various assignments across the country, uh, aircraft carriers and, you know, things like that, uh, until finally retired. As, as, a, as a young man always aspiring to fly, what was the day like when you found out you were going to become a member of the Blue Angels? Oh, gee. Um, <clears throat> it was, it, well... I, I can honestly say it was just disbelief because when you're going through that process, you, you almost have to detach yourself from the process, be yourself, but then you have to somehow get in your mind, I'm okay with this, however it comes out. Statistically, the chances of getting selected are really small. So, uh, I mean, you, know, you don't want to build up a, a, a huge expectation uh, and, and so literally I, I had uh, to take some time <laughs> to, and they mess with you a little bit when they call it to tell you, you know, that you've been selected. And I can't tell you what, how they mess with you, but <laughs> they do. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, I mean, it was just amazing. And then um, it was a late selection that year and for some reason. And so it became a whirlwind after that. I had to go get, you know, measured for the flight suits, fitted for the helmets that they that they wear and all, and all of that uh, things that you have to do, administrative things. And then I had to get to Pensacola practically overnight because they were going to depart for winter training, you know, early January and that, that kind of thing. But it was, it, I mean, it had to be just one of the greatest feelings in the world. Oh, I can imagine. So what was it like once you're a member of the team and you, you head to, I guess, El Centro, California? Mm -hmm. And so take it, take it from there. What's it like? Um, the first time, when I first arrived at Squadron, one of the things they wanted to do was uh, the, the lead and the slot pilot uh, at that time uh, put me in the back seat of an F-4 and they wanted to go out and fly an air show sequence just to show me what it looked like. It scared me to death, frankly. I mean, I couldn't believe how close they were. If I could have reached through the canopy when we were airborne, I could have grabbed hold of the wingtip of the lead airplane. and. So I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> how, how in the world can anybody do that? Well, you don't start out that way. Winter training, you, you know, it's eased out until people start to get more comfortable and you keep uh, through repetition, get a little better and better and you get a little closer and closer and so on. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, by the time you get to your second year with the Blue Angels, uh, you have to tell yourself, you get so comfortable being so close, uh, you have to tell yourself to ease it out all the time. The only way you get better in that business is to fly closer together or closer to the ground. And at some point or another, you can lose all of the, the there's no margin for error. If, and, and so complacency is something you have to really fight in that business. It's hard to believe somebody actually gets comfortable that close together at that kind of speed, but it happens. What's, what's a day, the day of an air show when you're going to go out and, uh, and perform for an audience? What's that day like? Um, well, it's, it's uh, very orchestrated in the sense that uh, the schedule is down to the minute from the time you get up to the time you get in your, your transportation, whatever that is, to get to the air show site. Uh, you brief that air show, you're looking at aerial photographs, you're getting weather uh, briefings and, and all that kind of thing. You're checking to see what kind of, what kind of show we're going to fly. There's three shows, the high show, rolling show, and flat show. So we decide which one we're going to fly and then, and then brief that, of course. Uh, and then if the weather is marginal, then we have to be able to switch to a, one of the other shows at, any, at a moment's notice. Uh, so. And then afterwards, every show is recorded, uh, videotaped, and then uh, we sit and debrief every show. And the, the, the goal is, ex is perfection in every maneuver. And, you know, rarely would you ever, ever actually achieve that, but it's always the goal. 
Something I'm curious <coughs> about, how is it determined who will be a part of the Diamond and who will be the solo pilots? How does that get determined? That's strictly a call made uh, by the, the leader of the team and uh, they, they talk it over. It depends upon uh, not everybody uh, that is flying with the Blue Angels or who has been selected to fly with the Blue Angels was necessarily flying the airplane at the time that the Blues are flying. So it might be experience in the airplane. Uh, generally, it's generally thought that the left wing and the slot are more difficult than the right wing to fly. Um, that may or may not be true, in, but, but it's thought to be the case. And it is a little more difficult to, to, to be three and four. Um, the solos have an entirely different mission. They're flying, the same mission in terms of recruiting, but in terms of flight performance, they're trying to demonstrate the edge of the envelope, the high performance capabilities of the airplane. And the diamond is, is, is really trying to demonstrate the artistry and professionalism of, of four airplanes together and that kind of thing. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very subjective assessment of what position you end up flying. But number three almost always goes to number four or slot. Okay. And in, in your case, um, when you first started in 1973, what sort of airplane were the blues flying? We were flying the F-4 in that year. And... Uh, for several reasons we may have time to talk about, we had uh, to switch to another airplane, uh, in, in, which was the A-4, uh, Skyhawk. And uh, the F-4 was, a, a, you know, consumed an awful lot of fuel, 10,000 pounds of fuel per airplane in a 40, 45 minute air show. Uh, 1973 was a year of the oil embargo. Uh, we had people in the Northeast and in California not able to buy gas to get to work. Uh, so when we'd land at an air show site, we were met by the media often uh, wanting to know how much fuel the airplane burned and that kind of thing. And also overlay that with in 1973, we lost six airplanes and, and three people lost their lives. Uh, the Thunderbirds lost three airplanes. They were also flying the F-4. Uh, that resulted in an investigation uh, by Congress and uh, long and short of that story is that the mission was uh, validated actually. The results on recruiting uh, for both the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels at the air show sites they visit uh, just go off the page. And these are not just inquiries, these are actual contracts signed for both officer enlisted. So they found that while there were losses and it was expensive, it was more cost effective to have the teams than to get the same recruiting results through conventional advertising. So uh, that's why we transitioned uh, to the A-4. The A-4 was an entirely different airplane, much more uh, maneuverable than the F-4 was. The F-4 was much larger, much more difficult to fly in the air show business, mm -hmm. uh, but it just made a lot of noise and it, it, it was a crowd pleaser for sure. <laughs> I, I bet. I so bet. That's, that was the transition to the A-4. Tell me about your first experience in a winter training. Um, it's in the book, you talk about it, but you had a rather interesting experience. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, um, well, we were doing what's called a trail loop. That It's uh, all four airplanes stacked one beneath the other, uh, and you just do a loop. Uh, it is a, a fairly difficult maneuver, but this one, uh, we, we're having great, you know, no problems with it at all during winter training. We were up, we were at the very next to last practice show before we started the air show season. And we were on top of that thing. We were ups, all upside down. And all of a sudden, I found myself flying on a fireball. And there are emergency procedures for getting out of each maneuver. Um, and in this particular case, the slot had to call clear before I could do anything. And so by the time he was clear, uh, then I was, I guess about 90 degrees, nose down, called clear, rolled away from the formation, um, and uh, started to check the instruments and then uh, started recovery. I pulled back on the stick and nothing happened. It just, the airplane just shuddered. And um, so I tried to check some more hydraulic pressures in the mirrors for fire and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden it was like time stopped, Jeff. It just literally, in my mind, it stopped. And all of a sudden I'm looking at this graph of a minimum ejection altitude uh, above ground level uh, and depending upon airspeed and dive angle. And I, I started looking at this graph and interpolating, you know, in, interpolating and, and that kind of thing. And all of a sudden I realized that minimum ejection altitude was 3,400 feet. And I looked at the altimeter, I'm passing 3,350 feet. So I'm, I'm going through 
the, the window for a safe ejection. So I immediately initiated an ejection, and there's a lot of detail what happens in an ejection, uh, and I described that in the book. And everything was fine, except that it was about 450 knots, and you can lose an arm uh, in that kind of airspeed. Uh, fortunately, didn't. Uh, ended up in the chute. Uh, some panels were blown out because of the, the high speed when it deployed. Uh, and so now I'm, I'm going through the procedures and deploying the, the seat pan, which has a raft in it and oxygen and some survival gear and things like that. And so every, I'm thinking, okay, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. Everything's fine. It's very quiet. And then all of a sudden I started hearing real funny noises, Whifferdill kind of things, whatever that is. And, <laughs> and all of a sudden I start seeing nose cones, outboard wing panels, gear doors, canopies, ejection seats are raining down all around me. And obviously if any one of those things had landed in my chute, we wouldn't be here talking today. Uh, but that's one of the experiences uh, in, in there that I, I, I think the thing that really, as I, as I look back on it now, the thing that got my, intention, my attention from a spiritual point of view was that the appearance of that chart that I never memorized, uh, but somehow, uh, in my opinion, God helped me somehow see that and, and, and made me aware of the fact that I was passing through the, the envelope for a safe ejection, and, and of course I immediately did that. So. There's more in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, as I said, I read the book. It is very, very interesting. And then, unfortunately, that you had a, another experience not too far, not too long after that, in, in an actual mm -hmm. air show. Correct. Mm -hmm. What happened there? Uh, that was Lakehurst, New Jersey, and uh, we were uh, just doing arrival maneuvers. That's routine. Uh, we have aerial photographs, checkpoints on the ground, and so we circle for a little while and. Uh, make sure we've got our checkpoints identified and then we do a, two or three maneuvers just to arrival maneuvers for the people to make be aware of the fact that we're there and so we were we were rolling in for just a what was a little v roll for several reasons we only had three airplanes in the maneuver that day and uh, so we it, and the little v roll is the simplest maneuver that the blues fly and uh, if there's one that would ever get perfect or do it perfectly, it would be that one. Uh, so we started up into the maneuver. Everything seemed normal to me, and we started the roll. Uh, everything was fine until we got inverted, and the boss called the keep it rolling, which was a signal for the slot pilot who was on the right wing at the time to get closer to the wing and for me to get further away. The aerodynamic loops of the airplanes interrelate and by doing that it would actually roll the leader around at a, fast, at a, a more rapid rate. And so we did that and we got the nose, noses down and I'm thinking we're having a normal recovery. And then the boss made uh, some calls that were unusual. He said it's gonna, he said, it's gonna be low, uh, don't go low. And then a moment later, he said, it's really going to be low, don't sag. And then he called for power, which was an unusual call as well. And uh, I started to feel airframe buffet, and I could tell that we had made the bottom, and we, I thought noses were going to start coming back up again. Um, and then all of a sudden, I saw in my peripheral vision, saw a flash on the right side of, of the formation. Um, and then a little bit of movement of the right wingman and, and then the lead airplane started to shudder a little and roll towards me and uh, I, I had nowhere to go. I couldn't, if I, if I rolled to stay in formation, I would be getting lower, which he just told us not to do. And so I broke out of the formation, pulled the nose up, stroked the burners and rolled upside down to see what was going on. Uh, what had happened was that the crew chief thought we were going to crash in the right wingman's airplane. He initiated ejection. Uh, he never got seat man separation and immediately went through a tree and was killed. Um, the uh, right wingman, the pilot, flew on. Apparently there was uh, some contact between lead airplane and the right wingman. The right wingman flew on for about eight-tenths of a mile and crashed without any radio calls, uh, never got out of the airplane. Uh, the leader started an uncontrollable roll to the left. Um, and he initiated ejection in a, a roll to the left, 90 degrees right wing down. The crew chief came out wings level um, of the airplane, never got seat man separation, went through the top of a tree, hit the ground in the ejection seat, and then came out of the ejection seat on ground impact, and then got up and walked away from it. If there was a miracle that day, it was certainly that, that the crew chief survived to the lead airplane. 
Unfortunately, the leader never got out of the airplane. He initiated ejection sequence, but never got out until before the airplane crashed. Mm -hmm. So that was a tragic event, and in part, that's what caused the transition out of the F-4 and into the A-4, along with the fuel. Yeah, and your following season, as I understand it, was a pretty good one, huh? Oh, yeah, the transition, the transition to the A-4 w went extremely well, uh, just a flawless season, and uh, so we were all real pleased about that. And I have to, I had to, it, it, you segued into the next chapter of the book, which has to do with getting married when you're assigned to the Blue Angels. That can be hazardous when you do that because they are prone to do some very special things for you. Yeah, yeah. and you talk about that in the book, and, and that's something that people will find definitely interesting is some of the things that go on behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah. In fact, there's part of it right oh, there. Now you, you can, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but there is a sword that's loose there, and it's it's spinning, and, and the reason, now, you know, in a military wedding, it's traditional to have the officer stand in, in, in form of a sword arch. And so that's what they were doing. And after Pat and I walked through there, I did an about faced and called a thing called Dead Ant. And that's kind of a long story, but it's just kind of a humorous thing that the team has done for decades. Um, when somebody gets loaded, and that means you're authorized to call Dead Ant. And when you call Dead Ant, then everybody has to fall on the ground, stick your arm and legs up in the air like a dead bug. And so, okay, you know, that's what we do, and it was, it was fun. But we did it in the sword arch thing, which now, as I look at it, you saw the sword was loose. That sword continued to fly around, landed right on its tip, about 12 inches away from the guy who lost control of it. You know, and I thought, oh my gosh, is our wedding gonna begin with one of the guys getting killed or, you know, wounded <laughs> with this thing? Oh, just a quick note about the dead bug thing or the dead ant. We found over time that there's two places that you just should not call it. One of them is when everybody's in a restroom, yeah. for obvious reasons. <laughs> I could see that. And the other one, uh, somebody called it one time, they were at an airway, jetway, jet airway, you know, and, uh, and they're all flying along, all six airplanes in formation, and somebody called it up there. Well, everybody just rolled inverted <laughs> and <laughs> flying along upside down for a little while, and they said, you know what, we probably really shouldn't do yeah. that. You know? <laughs> so anyway, Probably. yeah, there are some humorous stories. In uh, there. There's <laughs> some great stories in here. And uh, tell me about your transition out of the military. Well, Jeff, it, it's uh, um, it, it's I had a chance to fly for 20 years, consec 20 consecutive years, which was my goal. I didn't really want. I wasn't seeking to be a flag officer. I really didn't want to go to Washington D.C. and and have to do what you have to do when you're there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was happy to retire at 20. Uh, I really wanted to come back to Pensacola. One of the things that if you're in the military, you move around every two or three years. And uh, I, I really miss the opportunity to put down roots and uh, get to know people and make friends and, 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 you know, sustain those friendships and all that. So I was really looking forward to coming back to Pensacola and really getting involved in any way that I could. So I, I started working with the Chamber, volunteering with the Chamber of Commerce and got to meet a lot of people that way. Uh, Pat had a lot of family friends here that were very helpful to our transition. Um, the uh, opportunity to get into politics just happened to come up and so decided to try that and see how that worked out and and the rest is really kind of history. 20 years on the city council, 14 and a half years as mayor um, and I, I held several marketing uh, positions with various organizations over that same period of time. So it was, it was Pens I, people who live in Pensacola and have all their lives I very often don't have an appreciation for what a wonderful place this is. And I, I was stationed here eight and a half years out of 20. I move away, uh, live someplace else for a couple of years, and then I come back for one reason or another and then do that two or three times. Every time I did that, I developed a greater appreciation for this community, but most importantly, the people in the community. And I, I tell you, the people that live in this part of the world are the best there are, and it, it, I just can't imagine living anyplace else. Yeah. Did you enjoy the politics? I did. Uh, Pat and I both were, you know, had fun with it. Uh, local government is, being involved with local government is a place where you really can impact in a positive way people's lives. Um, and and it, it 
it's very gratifying. It was very gratifying for me. And I frankly enjoyed the, the challenges that sometimes present themselves. Uh, it was, I think, you know, I'm very proud of a lot of things that we accomplished over that time. Of course, we did transition towards the end of, of my last term, transition to a new form of government. Uh, I was very supportive of that. And so, you know, all of it was uh, very enjoyable. And I, even today, I sit back and watch it either on the computer or watch it on TV whenever I can. But now I can do it with a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. What do you hope someone will take away from this book? What message do you want to get across? Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, I was not a very spiritual person, frankly, and certainly not a religious person uh, at all. Um, I believed in God. I believed in Christ. Uh, you know, I always had get this warm feeling around Christmas time without for sure knowing why. I mean, it seems obvious, but, uh, but, but I, I didn't regularly attend church or any of that. <laughs> Uh, and then in the mid-90s, I began to have some experiences that the people would call them synchronicities or coincidences or something like that. And, uh, and it, it just kept recurring. And I talk about some of that in there. But what it did was open my mind to the possibility of a spiritual reality uh, that it coexists with us in this material world all the time. And that began to grow in me more and more. And I, I subtly at first, I, I found myself putting on Mannheim Steamroller Christmas albums in July and, and, and getting really something from that. Um, and then more importantly, uh, at some point or another, I, I, was, I had read the Bible before a little, you know, bits and pieces here and there. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I, I really felt compelled. I was drawn to it. And I started reading and uh, it, it just came alive for me. And so I actually had, I, I guess it's, it was a spiritual rebirth, really. And, and, it, and the peace that comes with that, uh, a, a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ is, is the most powerful thing that I've ever experienced in my life. And so that's really the, the, the message that I hope people get from this. And if you're Christian, I hope it'll strengthen your faith. If you're not, I hope it'll open your mind and your heart to that possibility. Name of the book is By the Grace of God. John Fogg's the author. Thank you, my friend. What a pleasure. Thank you, Jeff. Enjoyed it. You can see more of our conversations online at WSRE.org slash conversations. You also find uh, some of our programs on Facebook. All you have to do is search Conversations with Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.